EA Interviews, Episode 114. Inspiration, Transformation, Success Stories, and the Imperfect Action Round. Seven days a week. Join Mario Ficini for today's Expert Authority Effect interview. I don't know about you, but when I started my business, I wanted to get new leads. I wanted to get new clients. I'm going to blow this thing up. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to have all these cars. I literally was looking at cars to buy to have my sales team drive around Metro Detroit and go sell. And then I got an office and all these different things and then the studio and it was just like I want, need a business. This and To me, it was a big building. And I quickly realized the business is serving people in your clients. And how do you get clients? It's with leads. And you don't get clients unless you follow up and nurture those leads. And so many people overlook the simple, tiny little fact. They don't have the continuity of getting a lead, nurturing it, following up. They just kind of treat it like if they don't buy in the first day, it's lost. It's no good. And that is not the case. And that's why I'm excited to have the CEO of Continuity Programs here, Mr. Kurt King. I'm going to bring him up right after we thank our sponsor. There's money in the metrics. Do you know yours? Pipedrive is the simplest and easiest CRM to close more deals, deepen your relationships, and increase your business profits. Get your free trial today at eainterviews.com forward slash pipe drive. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kirk King. Kirk, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling great, Mario. How about yourself? I'm excited to learn because I know you have a wildly successful business. You've been helping people in the CRM and lead space for quite some time. I mean, we're going on a decade since we've known each other. And I just want to know, why do you, why did you get into the business and why CRM and leads and everything? I mean, it's important to business, but you took it to a whole new level. Yeah, to be honest, um, the opportunity was there. So I was working in the automotive industry. Uh, I had a successful career there. And I found out about uh, this company that had been in business since 1973. And the founder was wanting to retire and he was wanting to sell the company. And uh, I went and met with him and over about six months, um, we worked out a deal where I bought the company. And um, then I thought, why? Well, you know, I've made it, right? I've done, I've done it, right? I've become an entrepreneur. And then I started realizing that a um, whole lot of things had to be improved because we needed to make sure that the leads that our clients were getting were actually being uh, converted. What were you finding as far as the leads not being converted? What were they missing in the process that you were able to deliver to them? Well, the, the most basic thing is, is just keeping in touch, right? Following up, following through. Um, so no matter what the situation is, you know, people often look before they're ready to buy, right? So you might look for a new kitchen or you might look for a new uh, furnace or a new house, or maybe you're even thinking about refinancing, you might check rates. And no matter what it is, you often, unless it's an urgent matter, you're checking before you're actually ready to buy. And that's an important factor for every salesperson to realize is that once, once somebody raises their hand and they say they're interested in something, doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready to buy right then, but because it's on their mind, we know it's coming in the future. What is the, would you say is the biggest thing most people don't do after the first initial, you know, the initial follow-up, because I don't want to give it away just yet. I'll let you do that, but I've seen what you do with your system and it's beyond impressive. And I know most people just get a card, follow up, they leave an email or a phone call, and that's pretty much it. What are some things they could do to ensure the sale, to help actually get, be able to help the person, even if they're just starting out or they already have a successful business and they just don't know what to do next. You know, Mario, it's one of the craziest things, Mario, is that when somebody gets um, a contact, you know, a potential customer, a client, the almost every salesperson only does one thing and they leave a voicemail. And that's about the extent of it. So the most important thing is, is to keep contacting them until you actually have a conversation with them. And I know that a lot of people are hard to get in touch with. A 
everybody's got busy lives, driving their kids around, you know, all this stuff, uh, demand on their career, their, their relationships, their, you know, the things that they've got going on in their job every day. But the truth is, is that, uh, you actually have to keep following up with that person until they actually have a conversation with them. And then once you have a conversation with them, just because they don't say they're interested to buy today doesn't mean that they're gone. It just means that you were the first one to the game, right? Which is a good thing, right? You'd rather be the first one to the game knowing that they're planning to buy a house in the next six months so that you can continue to maintain that relationship. But believe it or not, most salespeople stop at the first voicemail. Why do you think people do stop so early on? Do you think there's... Have you ever heard where people are like, well, I don't want to pester them? Sure, absolutely. And it, there is definitely that um, concern in everybody's mind. But if you follow it professionally um, multiple times, then the, the person on the other, uh, other side is actually feeling a little responsible. Like, hey, you know what? I need to call them back. They've called me a few times and I need to touch base with them and let them know that I am planning to buy a house, but not this week. So if you just keep following up professionally until you actually have that conversation, that is the biggest, um, the biggest paradigm shift in my opinion. So tell me what you do for real estate agents, because I know there's people going, I've actually heard people say, I just go door to door. So I save money on ads. And I've heard other people say, they, they, I've had other people tell me what they're doing, and it seems like it's everything under the sun. And I know there's this fine balance where you want it to be more than you because I, I still can't wrap up my head around not spending even a thousand dollars on ads and then walking around for four days straight. But there's other people that just kind of throw everything out there and they don't really know what's working. How do you improve this process for your customers? Well, first of all, um, there are a very small percentage of agents that actually walk neighborhoods door to door. And if you did that, you, uh, in some neighborhoods, that would not be uh, a good thing. Uh, what we found to be the most successful is if we send out a mailer throughout the neighborhood, first of all, announcing the agent, maybe they've sold a few houses in that neighborhood already, they're an expert in that neighborhood, and then actually giving the agent the list of addresses where those mailers went. So they can actually walk around and say, hopefully you received my mailer last week, but I just want to come around and introduce myself. So for that small percentage of agents that actually go door to door, it'd be better for them to have a list and actually say, hopefully you received my mailer. I want to introduce myself personally, to follow up with the mailer. It's kind of like telling somebody you're coming to the house before you knock on the door. Give them a little bit of a warning instead of just dropping in at 1030 at night when they're watching a movie. Exactly. Huh? How many touch points would you say it takes to make the sale or at least get the conversation going? Yeah, that's that's a very, uh, a very good question. It depends on which industry. Uh, mortgage um, loan officers have it a little bit easier. Uh, those sales usually convert within six months. Uh, real estate agents usually take about a year in many cases. And it's not because they're not looking during that year. Um, the consumer has to go through a process in their mind where they realize that just because I want $500,000 house, if I'm approved for $175,000 house, that there has to be that um, realization on the consumer side. And Sometimes that takes weeks. Sometimes it takes a few months. And then once they come to the realization that I'm looking for the best house that I can get in that price range, uh, sometimes they're putting in offers on houses, they're getting outbid. Sometimes they get a purchase agreement um, and then something goes south on the, the inspection. So it usually takes about a year from, from the initial contact that somebody's looking at houses to the point where they actually close on a home. 
I think that's a great point you're making because so many people, if it's not 14 days to 30 days, maybe I'll give them the benefit out of 45 days. I mean, you said a year. That's not a small chunk of time to, uh, you know, houses are a larger sale, but still, that's still 12 months. Is there anything you advise your customers as far as just overall patience? Like, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be worth it. You know, here's what you can do in the meantime. Yeah, so with a good system in place, uh, it can help um, aid that process, right? So let's just say that you find out that um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones are looking for a house and, and you make a phone call, you leave a voicemail, you leave another voicemail, you leave another voicemail, and then eventually you speak to them and they say, yeah, I'm interested in buying a house, just not, you know, in the next few months, right? And then just putting them into a system where it'll automatically keep sending them communications, letting you know, let, reminding that client that I'm here to help you when you're ready. And it sounds like a simple thing to do, um, but it's often a challenge for a lot of agents to actually put just you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones' name into a system, put their email address in the system, and let the system take over. And I don't believe in just um, relying 100% on emails. You know, an occasional phone call every other month is a really positive way to, to differentiate yourself from other agents that might also put them into like a drip campaign. And how long do you run the drip campaigns for? Uh, we traditionally run them here until they buy or unsubscribe, I guess. <laughs> now, let me ask you about that because, you know, a year later, someone's going might be going, wow, that's a long time. Conversely, in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that long. It's only 12 months. Yeah. But I know you also don't want to annoy them. So do you keep the frequency higher in the beginning, high throughout the whole thing? Does it fluctuate? Tell me more about what you do as far as the frequency is concerned. Yeah. So, um, you know, based on uh, direct consumer industry best practices, we've learned that a high frequency in the, in the beginning is best practices, and then it should slowly tail off. So it might, it might start out with a few emails just in the first week, and then it goes to once a week, and then it goes to every other week, and then every third week, and then eventually it goes to a monthly touch point, and that monthly touch point will keep going on until they actually convert, get a house, or they unsubscribe. Well, that's good because I think there's too many people that keep the frequency high like the entire time, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months, and it's just like, I didn't open the last 18 emails. You sending me 35 more isn't going to change anything, but I know you're still there. And I'd say that's the main thing is just letting them know you're still there. So when they are ready, like you said, they'll convert or they'll buy. Absolutely, Mario. There, there's a fine line there of reminding somebody that you're available to help them and so much that they unsubscribe. So if you think about like a retailer, uh, my wife, I think, signed up for every retailer there are. Um, of course, we use a different email address for that. Uh, but retailers are ruthless. You know, they'll send four and five emails in a day, right? And if they were sending it to me, the occasional time I buy my wife something online, you know, I'll unsubscribe by the second email I get, right? So you really want to balance that uh, touch point with with the process in which you're selling, right? So, you know, you're not trying to sell a sweater online or a pair of shoes online. You're trying to sell them a $200,000 house. So to send them four emails, five emails a day, you're just gonna upset the client to the point where they're unsubscribed right away. So. Yeah, that's something to be aware of because you have to tailor it to your customer or client, that's for sure. So I love what you're sharing with the process and it is given some great expert authority insights on to, you know, play the long game, but be aware of what you can do in the short game and don't annoy them. Let me ask you, what's your biggest success story from someone who was just doing whatever they were doing before and then they started using your system and what was the end result of that? 
Yeah, so um, we can talk about that in two two aspects. Um, there was a bank with about 12 loan officers that had never had a system in place. Um, and they actually signed up uh, with us and we put in, I don't know, about 15,000 rows of data, you know, bank customer data. And then all of a sudden they started realizing that their customers were always putting their house on the market, right? So people are doing this every day. People are putting their home on the market every day. But without a system tracking those people that are putting their house on the market, you know, the bank was under the illusion that all of their customers were coming back to them. And, and they weren't, right? They were being uh, they were being easily swayed to different lenders. Uh, they were picked up by some of the large consumer direct lenders. So they were able to actually um, kind of tighten up the funnel in their own customer base and bring back two, three times more repeat customers. So within just the first six months, um, generated about 600 leads. And then within the first year, over 1,100 leads. And the uh, SVP of the bank realized, oh my goodness, I need to hire more loan officers. The first time in our history, we can't keep up with the number of leads that are coming in. Uh, so that was exciting. And then we see the same thing in real estate too. So. Um, it's usually set up in the enterprise level because we have to do all the data feeds have to be set up where the MLS data feeds come in and a lot of the data feeds come in with the contact information. So we usually set up at the company level. And then lo and behold, the market share of that real estate company starts growing, right? So here they thought that, um, that if uh, my one agent didn't get the house, another agent in my same office would get the house. And it turns out that wasn't the case. There's a lot of real estate agents, a lot of real estate companies. So just by using our program, they were able to retain and grow back market share in their area. Because there's a lot of homes that are bought, sold, and mortgaged every month, every year. It's a crazy number. So people are under the illusion that they're getting their customers are coming back to them. In most cases, it's less than two out of 10 will come back without a system in place. Wow, you were reading my mind. I was going to ask you what was the percentage because I know when you're dealing with large companies like that and you've got tens of thousands of, you know, leads, names, numbers, data points, whatever you want to call it, you know, you can go, hey, we grew 10% this year and what company wouldn't want to grow 10%, but you may have been losing 60 to 80% in the process and you think you're doing good. So I love hearing, you know, it's why I put it in the show. I mean, frankly, because I love hearing the success stories that, you know, you took them from 600 to 1,100 leads in six to 12 months. I mean, that's huge. Yeah, they hired three more loan officers and they converted 30% more loans that year. So, I mean, it's a really, it's a really exciting thing. Uh, you know, NAR, uh, National Association of Realtors, they do a great study every year and they identify how many consumers will go back to the same original agent. And then uh, the Mortgage Bankers Association, they also do this nationwide study. And for the mortgage guys, they usually end up with right around 22, 23% of their customers will come back to them, which means that 75, 80% are not coming back to them. And then the same stat almost exactly in real estate, if it was a buyer agent, um, it's a little bit over 20% will come back to them. If it's a listing agent, it's less than, it's less than 15%. So, and when you ask these, these consumers, like, why didn't you use your same agent or the same loan officer? It's, it's not because they didn't do a great job. It's because I forgot who they were. I forgot their name. And then turnover is a big thing in the industry too, which makes it really hard on the consumers. You know, a real estate agent may leave a company because they're going to get a couple more percent of the commission or a loan officer might leave a company because their feelings got hurt. But they really should think about that before they switch companies because for the last four years, their consumers knew of them at that company. Does that make sense? So it, let's say the consumer remembers that the loan officer was a great guy. 
And um, he, he always had a goatee, and his first name was Brian, and he worked at ABC Bank, right? Well, Brian left for whatever reason, you know, and he doesn't have a system in place to keep in touch with those clients after he leaves that company. You know, those clients that do remember his first name was Brian and that he had a goatee and he was a nice guy, they're calling that bank and the bank's saying, well, Brian's not here anymore, but now Jim can help you. So it's a real easy disconnect and there's so much turnover in the industry that you really got to have a system in place to maintain communication with all your clients. Because if you don't, you just leave a lot of a repeat business on the table. I, I agree 100%. When I went full-time in business years ago, I mean, when you have five clients, it's one thing, 10, it's another, 20, it's another, 50 and 100, things start changing. And I quickly realized that post-its weren't going to cut it. So first and foremost, within the first year, I, I got a CRM and I've been, you know, marching, beating the drum, marching the bandwagon, whatever the phrase is. And it astonishes me even to this day. And this is really pre-social media, pre-everything that everyone goes to. They're like, well, I just add them on LinkedIn. Well, I just add them on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And it's like, that's not a CRM. That's a great way for to stay in front of them, frankly. But that's not necessarily the business conversation or you know, tracking what they're doing with the email opens or did they get the postcard. I love that you incorporate the direct mail aspect of it. I think that's severely underutilized even nowadays. Yeah, so social media is very powerful. Um, but let's just say that you're connected. You know, I think you and I are connected on LinkedIn. If you don't go into LinkedIn, you know, the day that I post something, then you didn't see it, right? So, I mean, we've met almost 10 years ago, right around the time I bought Canary Programs. And... You've probably only seen a handful of my posts in 10 years. And then if you think about it, the same thing, let's say you decide you're going to use Facebook and a lot of real estate agents love Facebook. And, and I'm not discouraging it. I think it's a great idea. Um, but even Facebook is running all kinds of algorithms. And if one of your clients didn't click on a couple of your posts, then Facebook's not even going to show what you posted to those clients, right? So. To rely only on social media, it's definitely not a good business long-term tactic. You really need a combination of, you know, direct consumer uh, communication, direct touch points, uh, physical, electronic, social media. I mean, you kind of want to be, um, you kind of want to be everywhere all the time, and that's how those top-producing agents. Those top producing real estate agents, those top producing loan officers, those top producing teams. I mean, you can't drive them down I-75 without seeing a few real estate agents, teams, names. You, you, you can't drive um, down, you know, M59 and not see a couple of loan officers' names. And I guarantee you that uh, their clients are in our system already. So they're already getting touch points electronically. You know, printed touch points. They're they're being uh, if they type in that person's name and the company they work at. You know, their great testimonials are showing up online. They're seeing them on a billboard. They might actually catch a a funny Facebook post. Um, you know, you really want to be everywhere all the time, so that anytime one of their friends or family members or even themselves have a need, that they don't think of anybody else. Yeah, and I think that's great because I, I agree. Social is it has its place. Don't get me wrong. I love doing videos and posting, you know, whatever you want to do on there. But I love the direct mail. I mean, one of the most successful things I've done for lead gen, and I teach it to my author clients, is publish a business book and then send it to them. You can sign it. You can put your private cell number in it. It's direct mail, but it's not a stupid letter that they're probably going to just throw in a pile. I mean, it's it's substantial and you could send 10 of those out or 100 of them out and that's going to be way better than 1,000 to 10,000, you know, on the LinkedIn or whatever and hope that they see the post because it's only going to a very small percentage of that. And like you said, if you're not 
there for the day or the week, you know, we're all successful and we speak and travel and do all these things. It's like no one's sitting on there for 15 hours a day just waiting for you to post something right. if they're your ideal client. Yeah. It's great for humor, though. It is fun for humor. Um, I get a lot of kick out of social media, too. I, I think some of the memes are just, you know, make me laugh out loud. Um, but I, you know, I like that idea, you know, the book idea. I get books here. Um, and, you know, it shows up as like a box, it's lumpy mail, it sticks out. And, you know, you'd be kind of crazy not to look at it, right? So people do open those up. Um, I've found uh, the books that are sent to me, sometimes they'll send books um, and then they don't have anything in there. And then they send another, you know, maybe a second book, they don't send anything in there. And then they send an email that goes to my junk mail saying, hopefully you got my books. And that's that's not really a great concept. I really do like a, a short um, sticky note on the front of the book or, or a, a letter that's kind of folded in the cover of the book that says, you know, I'm sending this book. I think that it's going to help you. You know, I look forward to speaking to you. I'm going to follow up with you next Tuesday. If that doesn't work, you know, feel free to call me. And let me know when a better time to work. Just sending a book is is cool, um, but I think you really need to have, you know, the messaging in the book too, to kind of really understand why did you just mail me this book out of out of the blue. Yeah, I I agree. Putting the sticky note on the cover or right inside the front cover, um, I like to sign it. Always add a message because it does come down to the messaging, and you know. But that that's another way that you can say, well, this is direct mail. This is online. No, the same way you would say, well, what's better, Facebook or LinkedIn for a post? You can send anything in the mail, but if the message doesn't resonate and you don't have the call to action or the benefits or, you know, like you said, even why you're doing it, I mean, you might as well just send a fruit basket and put the word enjoy on yeah. it. Yeah. It, it sounds silly, though. I mean, we all have these books. Um we call it the, uh, a lot of people call them the, the pile of book of shame, right? So there's some books that we read all the way through, like, the, you know, Great by Choice or Good to Great or Crossing the Chasm or these, you know, these high renowned books. Um, and then we all have these other books where we start reading them and about a third of the way through, we lose interest. And then some we get two thirds of the way through, we lose interest. Um, and then there's some books that, we don't even open, right? So you got, you know, a dozen books in your office that you've never even opened. And without a message on it, um, anyway, if you're going to send a book, at least put a little note in there, a message, uh, why you're sending it to me and, and the reason you thought of me and why I might enjoy the book. You know, it might get me to open it and start reading it. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, that's that's another great point. You always not just want to get in front of people, but make sure they go through it. And like I tell my author clients, you want the cover good because if the cover's bad, they're not going to open it or read it. And if you're doing direct mail, the postcard's got to be good. So again, they want to flip it over, read it, take action. And if it's a video, it's the same thing. You need you need the headline. You know, no one's even with this. No one's going to listen to it if it's just like Two, if the headline's two people talking. Right. Absolutely. So it's a great point. Let me ask you just one more thing before we go to the – thank our sponsor and go to the imperfect action round. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur in the world, who would it be? Hmm. Probably Mr. Uh, Benefield, the CEO, who, who's the that? CEO of Salesforce, Mark Benefield. Oh, yeah. yeah. That would probably be the guy I'd like to have dinner with. I look up to him. That that would be fantastic. Salesforce is the first CRM. I uh, remember I said within the first years, like I knew I needed a CRM to do business the right way. Salesforce is what I went. Okay, with. cool. Yeah, that it's a great tool. Um, they're definitely, you know, they've got uh, a great platform, especially for business to business. And um, I look up to him. So that would be the guy I'd like to have dinner with. What would you ask him? You know, ask him how. Uh, all kinds of things. I'd ask him like how he found the best programmers and, and um, how we kept all the programmers on task, you know, so that uh, projects got done more efficient. Um, how he really uh, was able to 
ask customers what they needed and get the answers because sometimes the customers don't always know what they need. Kind of like Henry Ford said, if I would have asked the customers, they would have said, I wanted faster horses, right? So, you know, to build a platform as successful as Salesforce is, um, he definitely knows a lot more than I do. And I'd love to pick his brain over a dinner, that's for sure. It's a great answer. I think you're the first one who uh, who has said that. I would love to also, but He's a busy guy. that's a great answer. Thank you. All right. We're going to thank our sponsor and come back for the imperfect action round. Don't stay stuck in startup mode. That's what I tell my audiences and clients and why I advise using Pipedrive for all of your customer relationship marketing needs in your business. You want more leads, you want more deals, and ultimately more clients. Who doesn't? But when I deliver you 100 more deals a quarter, can you handle it? A month? A week? A day? Which one of those made you the most nervous? Saying you want it over and over like a record on repeat is one thing. The reality, however, is that your subconscious is stopping you at some point, and it's because you want A, but your business is set up for B. Whether you have a system or you are that system, Pipedrive will upgrade your deal-closing experience, increase your profitability, and make your day-to-day more enjoyable. Get your free trial today at eainterviews.com forward slash Pipedrive. Don't waste another day being this system or using a subpar system to grow your empire. There's no need to make it harder than it already is. Once again, that's eainterviews.com forward slash Pipedrive. And we are back with the imperfect action around Kirk. Are you ready to take imperfect action? Sure, I do every day. Yes, love that. All right, number first question. What? Okay. Um, What is the fastest path to the cash? Um, Solve the biggest problem. How would you say is the best way to find the biggest problem? Ask lots of probing questions. Okay. Number two, what is the biggest problem you see your prospects making and the fastest way they can fix it? The biggest problem is, is just that they can't, um, they can't successfully keep up in touch with everybody, right? The world is moving too fast. Um, you can't keep up with hundreds of prospects. You can't keep up with hundreds of customers. Uh, there's just really no, you can, you can do it with sticky notes or, or, you know, uh, Excel or a scratch pad when you've got five to 10 customers. But when you get in the hundreds and thousands range, it's impossible to keep in touch with them. So the best thing they could do would be to implement a system like ours where it's going to run automatically. And that's really what differentiates us from any other CRM is ours is really the the most self-driving car out there. It pulls in the data automatically, it runs automatically, um, and it solves the problem pretty quick. That's fantastic. It is impressive because you can have a great CRM. You know, you could get Salesforce, but all you're going to have to upload the data, you're going to have to maintain it and all of that stuff, and it doesn't do... You know, it's not going to be doing the direct mail and all the other stuff for you. It's a great start, but once you build out the funnels like uh, you do and have – have <clears throat> once you build out all the funnels and touch points like you do, that's where the, the real fun is. Yeah, you know, there's there's literally – I mean, I, 100 different campaigns that are running out of the system like every day. Like it's crazy. Like I can't even keep track of it uh, sometimes. <laughs> Uh, and there's just no way to do it without all the programming and software and everything like that. So, Last question. What is the best way to maximize customer lifetime value? Yeah, it's actually not that complicated. Um, kind of goes back to the golden rule, you know, treat people the way you'd want to be treated, uh, be honest, professional, caring, show empathy. Um, you know, throughout the entire sales process. Um, and that could be when you first talk to them a year before they're ready to buy a house. And it could be a week after they closed. Um, but just having that, that genuine care about you. I mean, we've got, we're north of 22,000 users in the system. 
right now and uh, quickly approaching 23,000. And that's 23,000 uh, commission-based salespeople that I'm thinking about how we can generate a lead for them every day, right? So that they can have another closing, they can get another commission check. And every day it's weighing on me and it's weighing on all my staff. Internally, we say things like, hey, we gotta get them leads so they can feed their families, right? So we take it very seriously. But no matter what sales job you're in or, or what consumer facing job you're in or, or whoever your prospects are, just having empathy, um, having that genuine, I care about you, um, I think is the, the thing that resonates the most because everybody's moving so fast. They don't take time to, to breathe and just talk like, like human beings. And then once you have that relationship, don't just forget about it, right? Put them into some kind of system. You know, reach out and touch base with them every few months, call them on their birthdays, call them on their anniversaries. You know, one of the best books I think was ever written was How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the first few chapters is that simple. You know, send somebody a birthday card, call them every once in a while, say hi. And um, kind of, it kind of hasn't changed all these years later. It's, it's, it's the uncommon common sense, huh? Yeah, I just, just trying to stay connected with people, you know, I, it's, you don't know what people are going through every day. You know, sometimes they post those memes online that says like, you don't know the battle that that person is, is at war with right now. Uh, so just be kind with them. So, you know, the first time you call somebody, you don't know what they're going through. So at least be courteous enough to call back and say, you know what? Tried to catch up with you last week. I'm still thinking about you. I just wanted to touch base with you. It just goes a long way. Yeah, I, th I, I'm glad you said that because I, I agree. I saw something recently, and it was like a crochet knitting whatever, and it shows the finished product. <clears throat> it shows the finished product, and it looks phenomenal on the front, but the back, it's all that, you know, crazy stitching and everything and it's like you never know what's going on behind the scenes no and, and people often won't share that until you get to a much deeper level relationship with them and most of your consumers most of your your prospects even your professional clients are probably never going to share that level of information with you or a very small percentage would so just being kind and um, understanding you know sometimes we call a bank and we'll call a bank for six months, right? Mortgage, a mortgage bank. Uh, we know they've got a good mortgage site division. And we call them and call them and call them and send them communication, emails, letters, same thing that we do. We drink our own Kool-Aid. And then, you know, we start getting frustrated, like, oh my gosh, why aren't they calling us back? Here we can help them. And in the last six months, they've lost, you know, 5% of their customer base because they went with somebody else. And we start getting discouraged. And then I have to remind myself, well, you don't know. They probably had turnover at the bank. Maybe they're wearing three hats. Maybe they got an FDIC auditor in there. Maybe they've got a new president of the bank. Maybe they're going through an acquisition. Maybe they're trying to buy somebody. Maybe they're potentially going to be bought out. So you don't know what people are going through. So just being consistent, following up, and being kind and treating people, you know, with respect, it, it I think it works in the long run. Great advice. Great advice. What is a book you would recommend to Expert Authority World? Um, the first one I recommend to every young person is literally how to win friends and influence people. Um, one of the best books I uh, recommend for new managers is um, is it don't uh, don't take the monkey one minute manager. I love that book. Um, those people that are, that are, have that certain personality that resist change, you know, have them read the book about uh, who moved my cheese, right? It's a great book. And then, um, a couple of my favorites is like, I, I think I even mentioned them earlier today is, you know, good to great, great by choice. And then crossing the chasm, which is really what we're trying to do here at County Programs. We're trying to get up market share across the chasm. And you know, get exponential growth through referrals from our user base. So, those are those are some good, some of my favorites. 
Great and recommendations. It's always, to, it's always good to read the Bible too. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's you have great recommendations in there. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I want to thank you and want to say, where would you like everyone to check you out at? Um, I'd like us to check us out at continuityprograms.com. It's our website. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or on Facebook. Um, pretty active on social media, of course, knowing that not everybody gets to see your post. Um, and then if you're in the Wall Break area, just stop by our headquarters, believe it or not. Uh, we're here 8 to 5, uh, Monday through Friday. Um, I think uh, we've got somebody coming in today to use our guest office. And uh, we've got coffee here. Love to give people nickel tours. And uh, we've got agents, loan officers, comfort advisors um, kind of stop in all the time. Managers stop in. Graphic designers stop in all the time. Um, so, yeah, we have an open door policy. When you walk in the door, it says welcome. And uh, happy to give you a cup of coffee and give you a nickel tour. I would encourage anyone to do that, too, if you are in the area. It's a very nice office, and I am appreciate you uh, for that invite. Yeah. Well, hopefully you'll show up here, too, Mario. I would love to come back. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, Kirk. All right, Expert Authority World, we have another great one here today. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day, and God bless. How can you know where you're going if you don't know where you're at? Pipedrive CRM makes your business easier, more enjoyable, and more profitable by allowing you to easily organize your deals and move them through your pipeline, whether you're in the office or on the go. Get your free trial today at eainterviews.com forward slash pipe drive. Stop wasting your time continually looking for your information when you can be investing it, adding more value to your prospects and clients. Once again, that's eainterviews.com forward slash pipe drive. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you got a lot out of it. I know I sure did. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to subscribe to the show. And also be sure to check out eainterviews.com for complete show notes, the full interview video experience, links to the resources we mentioned, and more. Have a blessed day, and I'll see you tomorrow.